Welcome to Emily's garden. Come on out today. Welcome to Emily's garden. Just a snap away. In this place, life is celebrated. It's the place where dreams are cultivated. Welcome to Emily's garden, just a snap away. My name is Emily. Welcome to my garden. It's the place where dreams are cultivated. I have a great show planned for you today. Join me at opening ceremonies for the Herbal Symposium held every two years at Wheaton College in Norton, Massachusetts. Wheaton College has been the home of the International Herbal Symposium since 1992. Speakers and teachers gather from all parts of the world to make this happen every two years. I uh, give you the one and only Wilbur. <laughs> I want to thank all of you for coming and just you know showing up again. I don't know. There's just something really, really unique about plant lovers. I think it's exactly because of what Jeff said. Because of what we receive from the teachings of the plants. Yeah, they're incredibly rich in chemical constituents that heal our bodies, and they're so beautiful, and they heal our soul. But something very deep in them connects to something very deep in us. It makes us fully human, makes us whole in the way that humans are really meant to be and can be on this planet. We have a couple traditions here that I want you to really take seriously. One is we ask that each of you connect with a new friend for life. It's like making some new friend. Um, it's a way of reaching out. So I learned this, by the way, there was a wonderful conference that Frontier used to do out in the Midwest. A lot of you used to go there. So we really just want to encourage you to do that. And what it is, is just a way of really connecting. There are, you know, almost 800 amazing, fabulous web lovers here. Turn to the person in front of you, turn to the person behind you, turn to the person on each side of you right now and see if you know each other. So we The Herbal Symposium is a gathering that nurtures body, mind, and spirit. An labyrinth placed just outside the chapel welcomes all. Focused walking meditations are highly efficient at reducing anxiety as well as promoting a relaxation response. For thousands of years, human beings have created these spiral paths. Closing your eyes and reflecting or taking a simple bow are other nice ways to begin the process. Acknowledge your coming meditative or spiritual journey within the labyrinth. When you're ready, simply walk out accepting the gifts and insight you may have received.
exactly on time. <laughs> Two o'clock. That's magic. We did a lot in that magic. We sat the tongue, we welcomed one another, we made new friends as we spoke. And now we actually have enough time to walk to our classes. Have a wonderful, wonderful day. Learn deep. Here we are at the 11th International Herbal Symposium, and we're at Wheaton College in Norton, Massachusetts. Wheaton College is really an integral part of this gathering at this point. We've been here for many years. I teach at many herbal conferences and many gatherings, but I must say that this one holds a very, very special place in my heart. First of all, I have been privileged to come to every single one of them. And so that's, you know, it's kind of like getting perfect attendance at school, which I was never able to do. All right. But since this only happens every two years, every other year, it's a little easier than coming to school every day. Plus, I get to see people that I know and love from all over the world <sighs> without having to travel so much. <laughs> we all travel and come to this place and spend these three magnificent days together and all honor and gratitude to Rosemary Gladstar, whose brainchild this was, and who so beautifully mothers and grandmothers it, to the point that she brings all of the herbalists together before the conference, and we get time to actually spend with each other. And a tremendous amount of learning and sharing and cross-fertilization gets to go on during that time. And then we feel really supercharged up and we come here and there's 800 students. Woo! <laughs> fantastic, huh? It is. It really is fantastic. Yeah. I'm going to ask you if you can tell us a website so that if people want to come and find out when the next conference is, because they are every two years. They are every two years. Sage Mountain would be the website that you want to go, sagemountain.com. Or you could come to my website, which is susanweed.com, and just say, you know, I couldn't find it. My wonderful wise woman web, who knows all about such things, will help you. This has been fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Emily. May your garden bloom and grow. Green blessings, everybody. Remember, herbal medicine is people's medicine. It's the medicine right outside your door. Tell me a little bit about your background, Paul. I know some mm -hmm. of it. My background's a little different than other farmers and herbalists in that I grew up in New York City. And of course it was early on in the Vietnam years and uh, very frustrated with government and friends coming home in body bags. And uh, there was no way I could stay in that life, that society, and uh, do my parents' bidding basically, and uh, I left. I hit the road with a group of friends and a mystical trip to California. On that mythical trip, I got waylaid by Taos, New Mexico, where I basically got adopted by my first teacher, which is a Shoshone man, and he kind of put me under his wing and started teaching me about plants. And I would have to say that was the beginning of my deep interest in um, herbalism. I have to make it short though because it's a long journey and generally uh, I pulled my backpack out of the truck, told my friends goodbye and I lived in that region with Carlos for um, probably six to seven months and I also felt a need. I had to get on the road for some reason after that, put my backpack on, head out on the highway and there was a green panel van with a couple long hairs looking at a broken down tire and I kind of ran up to them and said, what are you guys doing? They couldn't break the lug nuts on a flat tire, so I helped them change the tire and then I asked them a few questions because I had been studying quite widely already. I said, where are you guys from? And uh, he said, well, Athens, Ohio. What's that area like? It's beautiful. Surrounded by forests, surrounded by forests. You got ginseng, you got golden seal. We hear there's ginseng and golden seal all over. Well, I'll tell you what, guys, I'm coming back with you. We spent another month traveling around to some of Geronimo's hideouts and wilderness areas and headed back to Ohio, very great guys obviously, and ended up in southern Ohio in Meigs County near the town of Athens, which is the university they were from, and uh, 
following morning, I wake up real early, fall of the year, start walking up the road. Sunlight comes through the hillsides and it's illuminating the goldenrod, the pinks of the joe pie weeds, the iron weeds, the forest is becoming illuminated and the colors are starting to change. And uh, You knew you were home. I knew I was home and it wasn't long after that I've had the luck or pleasure to meet people who adopt me. And it wasn't long after that I met my physical plane teacher, Bill Clunch, and there are some crazy stories in that meeting. but. Uh, he was kind of the father I never had. I wanted to be self-sufficient. I was already a budding organic gardener, already a budding herbalist. And he just took all those concoctions and took me under his wing. And he gave me the physical skills I needed to lead the life. He gave me the skills to work a team of mules, to build harness, to shoe horses, to tell me about Appalachian farming. And he also said, Paul, you know, there's an old farm by my home place that has a cave on it. It was an old moonshining cave. Before I bought the farm, I bought the farm. To think about a cave on a piece of property that was a moonshining cave, that was it, and that is the farm I still occupy now, has become my teacher, my religion, my school, the place I make herbal medicines. That's a very short part of a long story. My paths crossed with you. It had to have been 10, maybe even 12 years 12 ago. 12 or 13 years. <laughs> I had attended the Herbal Symposium, which probably brings us back to almost the very beginning yes. of this symposium. Yeah. And we went on an herb walk, so I do remember a lot of your story. Mm -hmm. You also spoke about Arnold's Arboretum, mm -hmm. so you were up this way, which is Massachusetts area yeah. at, at some point. Mm -hmm. And you talked a lot about bees, well, I as did. I recall. Yeah, bees became a formative part of my life because they're so much a part of self-sufficiency. Um, there was a point I rejected, changed my diet, rejected white sugar, rejected most forms of normal American eating and searched out a different method, which is kind of easy when you're trying to grow all your own food, which I do and took up beekeeping, which is also a long road and not an easy thing to be proficient in when you're young. Bees are in deep trouble right now because of disappearing hive disorder, because of tracheal and varroa mites. So it's good there's some around left and it's good people know how important they are and uh, what's happening to them. Of course, a lot of what's happening to them is being proven, I believe, is because of all the herbicides and pesticides being used in agricultural crops in America. Part of this whole symposium and, and what you do is to light the spark. It is. So that you spread the word of really what's happening. It's called the green spark. And by me just talking to you or talking to a, another person, a student, an intern, I'm just passing out what I believe. And it's really the plants that are carrying it through me, through my mouth, through you, through the media, through a student who then can pass it on. So it's like a medicine. As Rosemary once told me, I asked her, well, you're not farming, you're in this place in Vermont. She says, I'm farming students, I'm farming people, and I have the same role now. And just by talking, you're passing it on, something you deeply believe in. In some ways, I feel we're trying to save a bit of the world that's collapsing all around us. It's important. Very important. Yeah. You mentioned that you settled in Ohio. Yes. What part of Ohio? It's southeastern Ohio, which is much more like uh, West Virginia. We're the foothills of the Appalachian Range. And also, as I've discovered, just the seat of incredible herbal botany. Botanists and herbalists come to the farm and the botanical sanctuary from all over the world, and they're blown away. And I realized just how spoiled an herbalist I have been and am to live in vast amounts of golden seal and ginseng and black collage and blue collage and so many amounts of trees and stuff. It was a perfect place to settle and I didn't even plan it that way and that makes it even more perfect. It just happened. The botanical sanctuary was created not just by me but other herbalists who came to visit the area. Rosemary Glasper of course being foremost in that because we were teaching together and her lesson to me is cute story. We're doing a walk together through what the property is now the botanical sanctuary and I look around and Rosemary is missing. Damn, we got a walk going on here, a cop and attitude, what's going on? 
Well, back along the path, we are going through acres and acres of golden seal. So much golden seal, you can't help but walk upon it. Very rare in the world, I know that now. I go down the trail, there's Rosemary, this beautiful woman, and all I see is her head. She's totally surrounded by golden seal. I'm going, oh my God, Rosie. And I walk up to her and says, what's going on, Rosie? She looks up at me with this beautiful face and tear-stained eyes, and I'm kind of going, oh my God, what's going on here? We got a class. And she says, basically, do you know what you have here? A lot of freaking golden seal. <laughs> The lesson was, as Rosie taught me and teaches a lot of people, do you know how rare this is? I didn't. I do now. It was a good spanking. And it brings me really to more of, well, why a botanical sanctuary is necessary. Why is it necessary here? Because if you look at southern Ohio, in Appalachia, our resources have been ripped out of the ground. Coal, limestone, logging, but there's something else that's even more important. That's these medicinal and edible herbs that we have so many of, as does West Virginia, Kentucky, Tennessee. Appalachia is really rich. If you hold the population at bay and give them low wages and dangerous work, you control an area because the money's so needed. In the first coal, the strip mining, which is so horrible around the area that I settled in, they were giving farmers 10 cents a ton to destroy the earth. Doesn't seem fair, does it? No, it doesn't. Yeah, but money is a terrible god sometimes. So you really took control of your destiny, and in doing so, you're really helping the planet. You're self-sufficient? Pretty much, yes. And you pass along the green spark. I'm trying to do that. Whether I took control of my destiny, or plants took a hold of my destiny and said, you have no choice, fool, here you are. I don't have the answer to this day, and maybe that's good. I have to bring up a point. Came on the property, and Paul and I crossed paths that's right. again. Again. You did leave an impression on me all those years ago. Oh, wow. I remembered mm -hmm. your face. I remembered what you said. We actually went on the walk over yonder. That's right. And during the course of the quick meeting, mm -hmm. we crossed paths again three or four times. And he did, in effect, say, Sometimes you have to listen to the signs. You have to look for the signs, pay attention. You're an idiot if you don't, but most modern world doesn't know that anymore. But no. I work in, walk in a green world, a plant world, and you really do need to pay attention. You, you have to be open. You, you definitely have to, be, have to be You open. have to be so wide open it can hurt you. I haven't taken that complete cross as you have. And it's very hard to keep that balance between trying to live in the world so you can keep your house. I don't live off my land. So you can do the other things and keep those signs open. And I think that there's a wide population like myself. Mm -hmm. So I guess the advice that I'm going to give to you is to be open to the signs and take this example for what it really should be. The world needs us now. Yeah. Listen to the green plants. Need a better life. Talk about the devastation that's being created right now by big agriculture, big chemicals, because it's not good. Not good at all. Just look what's happening with the weather pattern. I do most of my own food. I've gotten to a point where I'm so busy, I don't keep a milk cow anymore, so I do buy an organic yogurt. Yeah. I don't make my own bread anymore. I've devised a formula that a, a local company, I get my bread. So um, because I'm so busy, and I've never stopped being busy since the moment I entered that world and stepped on that farm and met my teacher, Bill. It doesn't stop because I have a mission. And it's just to try to make a better world, to whatever means I can, through passing out the green spark, through making herbal medicines. And to this through, interview. To this interview, in this moment, and here we met again 10 minutes ago. How perfect is that? I attended your lecture yesterday and I thought it was absolutely wonderful. What I wanted to do was try to get you to talk to me a little bit about it, maybe do a brief description to the audience of what this is all about. It started with Bach, didn't it? Uh, it started with Bach for a uh, modern era of flower essences. It started with Bach. Edward Bach was a British physician, best known for developing a range of remedies called the Bach Flower Remedies, 
a form of alternative medicine. Bach's remedies focus on treatment of the patient's personality, which he believed to be the ultimate root cause of disease. The remedies contain a very small amount of water material in a 50-50 solution of brandy and water. Because the remedies are extremely diluted, it is claimed that the remedies contain the energetic or vibrational nature of the flower and can be transmitted to the user, relying on the concept of water memory. Bach's remedies focus on treatment of the patient's personality, which he believed to be the ultimate root cause of disease. A trained flower practitioner may recommend remedies after an interview before choosing the combination they feel best suits their situation. Now you went into depth about diagnosing someone. Yeah. You really do look for the signs within a person mm -hmm. to know what flower to use. Picking up what we are talking about, I have a stressful life, I have all the time stress, my parents stress me a lot, this kind of stuff, again, the world, and how much stress is going on in your life, um, and what exactly you want to work on, and then sometimes you say, okay, you know, I really need to work on that, and flower essences will tell you. Bach's flower remedies were intuitively derived based on his perceived psychic connections to the plants. If he felt a negative emotion, he would hold his hand over different plants, and if one alleviated the emotion, he would ascribe the power to heal that emotional problem to that plant. A lot of it is um, work with a flower itself and meditating with a plant. So meditating with a plant and receiving the information from plants from the first hand. So they who teach us what are they for. It's not in laboratory experiments and how this, this work and how it doesn't, but they, receive, they give that information to us. I first select the uh, essences that I think right. and feel that are good. Yeah. Then I check with the Aussie, yeah. is there anything that I missed or would be good to do that I couldn't think about that? And usually, always, mostly, there's a one or two essences that they come out and you read why you need them and you, wow, how clever. So they are clever enough. Okay. <laughs> There's no yeah. real set rule with this. It's really all about meditating on the flower and what's calling you. Oh, yes and no. Because from another perspective, if, if multiple people feel the same thing, so it is exactly what it is, right? Now, what is the dowsing? I heard you say moving back from left to right. Or... So dowsing, can, can you use a pendulum to uh, select the flower essences. So it's, um, there are special classes kind of that you can take how to douse, but in simple way, everybody can do that. Just to know how to hold the pendulum and know what is the yes, no answer for, for yourself, and then douse and see which flower essence should be used for this specific person. It's not only dowsing, but the knowledge too, which flower essence to use. Fascinating. I have a small practice in, um, uh, Swamscott Marblehead area near Boston and yes. I see clients uh, there and... Um, do you have a website? I do have a website, it's called Sage Essences okay. um, and there's also a bit of information about flower essences, about me and um, how I do consultations. Alright, thank you so much. Thank you. You've been very gracious. Thanks. I'm with Rosemary Gladstar, one of the founders of this whole event, and it's wonderful. Thank you. Can you tell me a little bit about it? For many, many years, we started hosting small herbal events in California. They were very grassrooty. Mm -hmm. It was back in the early 1970s, and it was wonderful. It helped to grow a community. They were uh, very educational. There was lots of amazing workshops, but there was also this connection, like kind of a connection to a tribe. We were all considered kind of strange and weird, like herbal medicine, what are you talking about? So, you know, to find one another and to kind of spark one another, and this was before any of us had written books or were working in hospitals or doing clinics or anything. It was a very grassroots kind of organic situation. When I moved to New England in the, in the, early, in the mid 1980s, there really wasn't anything happening like that out here. And so I just thought, well, we need to gather. And so we started gatherings and they were beautiful. And then we said, well, we're creating this global movement. We're creating this grassroots movement here that's really helping to to have blossom herbalism, but it'd be beautiful to create, to reach out and touch our global community. So that was back in 1992, and we 
invited a few herbalists. It was much smaller than it is now. It's grown really quite amazingly. And, um, you know, we had maybe four or five herbalists from other countries. And we began that dialogue of, you know, how are you working with plants and what are your traditions and what can we learn from you? Because really herbalists and plant lovers and indigenous people all around the world have always traded information. It's not, you know, it wasn't like they had to wait for the internet or the, you know, emails to do that. There's always been this massive trade of knowledge and skills and that has really circled the globe. So we were really just continuing the tradition. And over the years, it's grown to what it is here today at Wheaton College. This is unbelievable. And I have to tell you, I did attend, I think it was one of the very first herbal symposiums held at Wheaton College here in Norton, Massachusetts. Oh, great, yeah. And I connected with Paul Strauss. Oh yes, and he's back again this year. He's back again. We had a talk and just what you were talking about, and I'm gonna name this episode, The Green Spark. Oh, great, yes. Because that's exactly what he talked about. It, yeah. it, it made sense of why I was here all of a sudden. Yeah, yeah. The media, to get The Green Spark Thank you. Yeah. out. So, I know that you have a website and there it is. <laughs> Can you tell me what it is? Yes, it's, it's, it's very simple. It's www.internationalherbsymposium.com. So, okay, and yeah. tell me a little bit about Plant Savers. This event is a fundraiser for United Plant Savers, which is a nonprofit, very grassroots organization whose sole mission is preservation of native North American medicinal plants. So we, our vision is, and plant stewardship, it's how to be- She's lovely. Oh, I know. Look Hi, sweetheart, that. you can come in. Hi. It's whole, and she's one of our little United Plant Savers, actually. She lives very close she's to our beautiful. big botanical sanctuary in Ohio. I know, look at this beautiful Lovely. fairy house that the kids made, it's so pretty. We actually helped to change the face of American herbalism by taking the attention off of just consuming the plants onto preserving the plants. We're gonna put them in the center of the circle. I think We're I'm getting ready go. for the circle, yeah. so I think it's time. I had a great time today. I thought I'd end this very special episode with a very special thank you to Rosemary for all of her hard work in being one of the founders of this wonderful organization. We're gonna propagate some Rosemary today. Now I've often done this in the middle of the winter time when I've been really yearning for a little bit of summer. You can actually buy this in your local grocery store. It's organically grown rosemary roots very easily in water. Remove the lower leaves, give it a fresh cut. All the places that we took the leaves from will form nodes where the roots will grow. Just suspend it in water. As you can see, I have a few going already. It won't be long before you have this ready to plant. I had a great time today. We part until we meet again. See you next time here in Emily's Garden.